I work in the maths department, um, but I trained as a theoretical physicist and really enjoyed my subject, which is primarily mathematical. And then when I was looking around for PhD opportunities, research projects, I heard that physics and maths was being applied to problems in neuroscience. I thought it was a little bit different to studying magnets and fluids and bridges and boring things. So I was very fortunate to get a research PhD position in London uh, to work in an area called neurocomputing, which is basically trying to borrow the tricks of the brain to solve real-world problems, like the ones that we solve as people. Use, we use our brains to do computations. Okay, so our brains are not like the laptops that, that we know and love now or the iPads. Uh, we solve real-world problems with the wet tissue in our heads. The brain is one of those examples of a really complex system. So we, we, we know how hard it is to explain things like the weather is a great example of a complex system. An even better example maybe the financial markets. No one's going to say they can really predict how the financial markets are going to behave. And if you, you know, look at, you know, at your closest friend or some of your family and ask how they're going to behave you know, the next five minutes or tomorrow, you're pretty sure they're a complex system. And so it's really the tools of mathematics for understanding complexity that, that make it appealing to look at the brain. Of course, Biology, as an experiment of science, might take things apart to look at them, but it's not really very uh, ethical to start, stay, you know, start taking apart people's brains to see how they work. We have to infer what they're doing by things like this, talk to each other, or even better, record the sort of electrical signals that the brain gives rise to. So it's a very famous electrical signals, uh, like the EEG uh, signal, um, and Nottingham is uh, one of those rare places that we have lots of neuroimaging technology available on campus. Um, Sir Peter Mansfield received the Nobel Prize for his work in, in MRI imaging, which is so prevalent now in, in medicine. So if you want to see somebody's brain, you typically stick him in one of these MRI scanners and you might see some sort of anatomical picture, or if you use functional magnetic resonance imaging, you see some activity of the brain. And so you can try and work out, you know, if I understand the activity of the brain, what is the computation that's being performed? And it might be nice to have a model of the cells in the brain or the tissues in the brain to see if rather than play with the brain per se, you can play with the model. And if it's a good enough model, then you don't need to put people's heads in scanners anymore. You can just play with the model. I am a mathematician. I do sit in my office with my pens and my, my bits of paper and you know, play with equations and, <laughs> and you know, hopefully prove the odd theorem or two. Um, but we have quite an outward facing attitude in our school. So, as a mathematician, I want to make my services available to the neuroscientists on campus. I'm not a neuroscientist by training, I'm just very, very interested. So we go and talk to our colleagues in academic radiology, the people that do the brain scans. We talk to our colleagues in hearing research that are interested in you know, helping people hear better, say with technologies of cochlear implants. Talk to my colleagues in biology that are just interested in fundamental uh, neuroscience, you know, how to how do brains make interesting patterns that then get turned into behaviours or computations? Um, so we're sort all of, you know, we like to be the friendly people on campus. Mathematicians that talk to biologists, psychologists, clinicians, and also more recently bioengineers. You know, as well as understanding the biology, it'd be nice to sort of reverse engineer the biology and have a, you know, an eye brain that sits on your desk and does computations for you rather than an eye Mac. Another good example is navigation. We're really good at you know, walking around campus thinking, oh, I drove in this morning, I put my car somewhere, I need to go and find it again. Um, so we have mental maps of the real world that we can use to navigate, and if there's some building work going on campus, we can think, oh, I need to go around this, or maybe take a shortcut. You know, you put a robot with a, with a you know, traditional programming uh, piece of software uh, in an environment like that, it's not going to do as well as we do. So there's certain natural things that humans do really well, and it'd be great if we could learn the principles by which they do that and get machines to do them equally well.